Hello, hello everybody. How are you guys? I am not at home today. I'm actually in Atlanta. Let me show you. I'm I'm in Atlanta doing a project. I'll open this thing. Um downtown. So as you can see, in the center of the city, beautiful city, beautiful place, lots of great things happening here in Atlanta. But for my video, it's just too much light. <laughs> I gotta get rid of all that light. Let me see if I could find a place where I could put this so that it looks okay. How about that? Nope, nope, nope. That's too far. How about that? How about that? I still need to get the right color. Hold on, okay? I'll be back. Good to go. Make sure my sound is right. Can you all hear me? You know, I was gonna do this live, but you know, I thought to myself, you know, I don't wanna test the live here in the hotel. Um, I just don't wanna, <laughs> I've never had good experiences going live and I'm just, I'm just, maybe I'm nervous doing live because it's so unexpected. I'll do it one day, I promise I will. But anyway, I'm here in Atlanta doing a project and I'm staying in the downtown Atlanta. Downtown Atlanta is not really <laughs> my place, right? It's too city, you know what I mean? Like it's just a bunch of people. One guy tried to sell me his CD. Some other guy, it's just, it just city life is, it's great, but at the same time, I don't like walking on the street in Atlanta at all. <laughs> I, stayed, <laughs> I stayed in my hotel. I went downstairs, I went to the Hard Rock. I went to some of the more popular places in the city, but, um, and everything is in walking distance because I really didn't drive because parking is such a hassle in the town. So I actually Ubered here. And so everything is walking distance anyway. So I just, yeah, it, the city has a different vibe. I'll just say that it has a different vibe. It's great if you're really a city lover, but I just found it a little bit too wild for me. So anyway, anyway, so what I wanted to talk to you guys today was I wanted to start sharing some of my experiences more. Um, I let you in a little bit more into my life so you guys can kind of see where I'm coming from here as you all know I am Jamaican right I'm sure everybody who follows me by now knows that because of my accent right so I'm Jamaican I moved here quite a few years ago the reason I moved to Atlanta was because my husband at the time I'm divorced now but my husband at the time was from Atlanta and so we were actually living in different countries <laughs> because I traveled a lot and at one point he was like, can we at least live in the same hemisphere? Cause one time I was in China, he was here, you know, it was, it was wild. So he's like, um, Kara, can we live in the same hemisphere? Like I have to wake up at night to talk to you. <laughs> it was really weird. And I felt bad. I'm like, okay, that's true. I really should be in the same continent at least of my husband. And so eventually we moved together. We lived together in Atlanta and then, uh, eventually we got divorced. Um, and now we live separately and he has a good relationship with my daughter and that's how we live okay but what i want to talk to you today is really that's just the backstory to what i'm about to talk to you about which is how i got my first job here in atlanta as a business analyst so when i moved to atlanta i was actually i found out i was pregnant like right after so well actually i found out before and i moved up when I was like a month in or two months in or something like that, I don't remember. But <clears throat> I was here, I was pregnant and he had to start filing for my documents for me to be able to work. So the whole, it worked out well because the whole pregnancy, while I was waiting for my documents, I also was pregnant, so I, you know, like I could work anyway. So it was you know, pause time because I've been traveling so much, I've been doing so much, I've been learning all kinds of stuff. I always put my education as a priority in my life and it was, I was all about that, right? So I wasn't really focused on relationships. So when I did get married, um, before I came to live with him, I was actually on a scholarship. So I've never actually paid tuition. I've never paid tuition, I have a master's degree, I've never paid tuition. I've always gotten scholarships. Um, and the scholarships have always been full scholarships where they pay for everything. And I travel with them 
sometimes. So I've been fortunate that way and it's all thanks to God. Y'all saw my origin story where I grew up very poor. I grew up with nothing, like literally nothing. So when I used to watch television and I would hear Americans complain about being oppressed and not having anything and, you know, life being rougher for black Americans. I didn't know what y'all were talking about. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> because I was walking two miles to school to get the bus, actually two miles to get the bus. And then the bus took you to school and you got off the bus and you had to walk another two miles. And this is not a school bus. This is not a bus that's dedicated to kids. This is a regular bus. You had to fight with everybody else to get in the bus. Um, yeah. And that was our life, but we, we kind of enjoyed, I guess, what you guys would consider suffering, we enjoyed it because I had friends, we had great rapport, we would walk to school, sometimes we walked from school miles and miles and miles. And on the way we'd stop and pick mangoes off the tree, you know, we would pick oranges. Like there was this particular farm that was on my way to school when I was like eight or nine years old. And we would walk all the way to school without parents, without adults. Like it's, this was the nineties and it was okay. <laughs> now my mom would be scared to do that with my daughter, but at the time that was what everybody did. So we all walked to school together, a bunch of little kids walking for miles. And there was this one particular farm that we just loved because it had lots of like rolling hills, beautiful hills. And there were orange trees that were always, I don't know, it seemed like they were always in season. And so <laughs> while they were walking to school, we'd run over there and it, the man's name was Mr. Brown. And run over there, we'd pick Mr. Brown's oranges at the front because it was near to the, the fence, it was near to the road. And we'd go pick his, his oranges. And sometimes the dog would run us down. <laughs> we would be running from the dog and grab the oranges, put our backpacks, run. I was about to call and say, yeah, little kids, stop coming over here. But he was, he was reprimanding us, but he was at the same time encouraging us because he would leave the gate open, right? And he would make sure there is enough. If, if there was mangoes off the tree, you would have like little baskets with, ma with mangoes or oranges. So it was a, he was a kind person, but he just didn't want us to think that they would just come and take his stuff. But at the same time, he was helping us. Like he was trying to be helpful. So we just had a great rapport, right? A great vibe. In Jamaica, we call it liberty. It's like, just have this culture that it was just really, we were all poor, but we were all having fun, if that made sense. So that's how we grew up. Um, obviously the country has changed and there is a lot of things that are influenced how Jamaicans are. I mean, like everybody else, the culture is changing because of the internationalism and everybody's watching TVs and adopting what they see on TV. But anyway, so I grew up like that. I was very poor. I knew I was poor. I didn't want to stay in that poor environment. I had things that I prayed for that you guys would think is like normal. Like I prayed for things that you take for granted because you have it. I'll give you a story about some of those things another time. But growing up with that background, I always knew that I didn't belong there and I wanted to get more. I wanted more. And I had different experiences from going to school. Like for example, my very first major exam, it was at the time it was called um, um, common entrance. Yes, it was called common entrance. It was an exam that you would take to get to high school. And there were certain high schools that were better quality than others, right? And so I wanted to go to the high school in town because that's where everybody who became successful went to. But when I did the exam, my mom being you know, a simple woman, my mom doesn't have a college education. She hardly has a high school education. She dropped out of school just before high school. So she's not very well educated, but she's such, she has such good heart, such good love. Like you would not want to have anyone other than my mom in your life if you're growing up like me. Like, you know, she was just supportive. She don't understand what she's supporting. She don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> But she knows that if I'm so committed to it, um, you know, she's just going to be like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what this thing she's going to do right now at this college or whatever, but I pray that you bless her. Right. So that's the kind of mom I have. So at the time when we had to sign up for the schools, my mom having no idea what to do. She went to church. Her church folks told her, well, everybody in this neighborhood goes to that particular school. So when you go to pick your daughter's school, pick the one that everybody in the neighborhood goes to. Now my neighborhood is a poor neighborhood. So obviously we're going to go to the worst school. So, <laughs> so my mom goes there and my mom picks the school that I don't want to go to. 
I didn't want to go to that school. I want to go to the, high, the, the school with higher grades, with kids who are coming out to be doctors and, you know, professionals. And you see them on television in Jamaica. And I, that's where I want to go in town. That's where I want to go. My mom picked this country school for me. Country school up in the bushes. So in school time, we would walk to the bus stop and the majority of people are going in that direction towards the city. I'm going this direction towards the country. I was so mad. But anyway, I did the exam. And what the reason why I brought that up was because I've always been fortunate. God has always had a hand in my life and I didn't know it. I, I had no idea that that was what was going on. I'm, too, I'm eight years old. I don't know anything. So um, when I got to 10, was it 10? Yeah, 10 or 11 or something like that. I had to take this um, common interest exam. I don't remember if it's 10, to be honest. But anyway, I had to take this common interest exam. And normally you have to wait for you, your, you to be in grade six to take it. In our school, we have basic school and it's a whole different system. But anyway, you had to wait to reach this particular grade to take this exam. And I was in five and I was a year younger than they required. But my teacher thought I was doing so well that she thought I could handle it. And so of all the kids that were in my grade, I was the only one selected to do that common entrance exam. Did it exam, pass with flying colors. But because my mom chose this silly school, that's the school I ended up going to. At the time, I thought it was silly. I thought it was silly. But so I was upset going to the school. I was like, now I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to suffer. I'm not going to get the good teachers. And I was really upset. And but I went anyway. And I went to that school and I made some of the best friends. I made good friends. I made good people. I was so surprised. And because it was a country school, I got exposed to things that I wouldn't get in the city. Like we used to have farms and you could go plant your corn and plant your potatoes. And so sometimes the kids would go to the back of the school and pick the corn and the potatoes and make a pot at school. <laughs> it was so much fun. School was so amazing there. It was amazing. And we were good at track and field and Jamaicans love track and field. So our school was always beating everybody else in track and field. So we were proud of our school. Oh my goodness. I met such great people. I met such great teachers i was completely surprised at how how much i thrived there thinking that i'm gonna be suffering or whatever and it so happened that the year i was graduating was also the year we had the highest scores in the entire country for our our class so we did so well when i got to um there's two grades where you get prepared for what we call a um, cxc exams or it's almost like a uh, final exam. I don't know how to compare it in America, but it's a it's a very important example to get into college, right? So <laughs> We for this first time the school was doing information technology as a as a career, right? So they were trying to select the best students to make the first cuts to do this new um, New exams and they wanted to make sure that you know, we were motivated We wanted to do it because they want to give the school a good impression or a good standing or whatever so they picked me among everybody else and we were the pioneering students to go learn information technology they taught me this silly thing called pseudocode and some silly things and i was like what is this i was so good at it i just i just because i was struggling before that i was struggling because you either did business or you did science in my in, in jamaica you did business subjects i did science and I like business. I didn't really like science, but I thought if you do science, you can become a doctor, you can become whatever. And those people make money and I'll be able to make enough money to get out of my situation because I didn't like where I lived. And but I didn't really like biology and chemistry. It just didn't, I, I didn't, but I didn't have love for them. Business was okay, but it, feel, it felt so simple. Like I felt like I wasn't learning much. Like, okay, business stuff. Like, okay, what is this? It, it, didn't, it, it didn't bring out in me anything passionate if that made sense so when they introduced me to information technology i was like uh-huh i can solve problems with this thing or what because i was worried about math i liked math but i felt like i didn't really do well at it so i'm like i can't do math very well i don't really like business i'm not going to be a scientist i'm going to be a failure in life that's what's going to happen <laughs> right? but when they introduced me to information technology i was like okay i can do this and so i spent a lot of time i could write the best pseudo code in the class i would do all this stuff i eventually went on to learn q basic i learned all i mean assembly language all this stuff i learned all that 
So I was just giving you the backstory of how I got here. I, I'll ramble a lot, by the way. I do ramble a lot. So I'm going to try to get back to this point of the story, which was my first job in, the, in, uh, in America. Get okay, back to the story, Carolise. Okay. And so I was pregnant. I moved to the U.S. I didn't have my green card. My husband was in the process of getting that for me. I eventually got it, and I had the baby, obviously. And I stayed home with the baby for a good long time. I stayed home with the baby for a while. When the baby got to three months, I said, okay, I think it's time to start looking for a job because I have never, honestly, guys, I've never actually lived with a man before. I never lived with anyone. I, we would date. He had his place. I had my place. I had my own thing. I was always like that. So um, when I went to college, and I, like I was telling you, I never paid tuition, so I always got a scholarship. So I got a scholarship for my bachelor's degree. I got a scholarship for my master's degree. Before I came back to live with my husband, they gave me a scholarship to do my PhD. And they said, you could stay. I was abroad at the time. They said, you could stay, and we'll give you a scholarship, extend your scholarship for your master's to do your PhD. And that would be another like five, four or five years. And I thought about it, and I knew my husband wanted me to come back to the U.S., and I was like, Lord, what do I do? Because I really, really like, I like being in college. Let me just say it that way. <laughs> I liked being in college. I liked the people, I liked learning different things, you know, and because I was traveling abroad and it was paid for by the governments of those countries, I could travel to different places. I could see things I wouldn't see and it was not on my dime. I liked it. I did. But I was like, damn, you married the man. The man's been waiting for you for like three years at this point. Can you like just be a wife? <laughs> I'm like, oh shoot. Okay, fine. And so I denied this scholarship. I, you know, my professor even told me, he said, you know, you have a master's degree now, you're married, you really need to decide decide if this is what you want to do. At the time I wasn't pregnant. I was like, I don't even have a kid. Um 30s is upon me and I'm like, oh my goodness, now I gotta do real life stuff. So I was like, fine. So I didn't take the scholarship, came back to America and decided to be, you know, a, a wife. And so it was a shock though. It was a shock because I'm not used to like being completely dependent on someone. I just, I just couldn't get my head around it. Like, okay, I am in a new country where I don't have any family. I don't have any friends. It's not like there's a government taking care of me. Like I was in the other places where I was studying. I'm actually, here with my husband and he's the only person i know his family was there but they weren't trying to be very warm and i was like after three months with the baby i was like i need to get a job i just need to get out of this house every day like i just couldn't stand just depending on someone for my existence i just can't stand it like i don't know i just i don't know how people do it i just i can't do it so i was itchy to get a job i really was so i started out i got caught up in I would call it like a Ponzi scheme because I was going out looking for something to do. Um, at the time my mom came up, she came up for the birth of my daughter and she stayed with us for a little bit to help me with a newborn. Cause I didn't, obviously I don't know anything about children. I've been spending my time, you know, in college. So I have this newborn, the thing needs to eat every four hours. The thing wakes me up. Like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> this kid. But she was so adorable. She changed my life completely. I, I, uncovered love I didn't know I could have uncovered love I didn't know I could have and I just she is such an amazing kid that I think that God knows that I don't have the the skill to be a mom of any kind of any other type of child like I couldn't do it but he gave me a child that requires so little of me and is so loving and is so kind and is she's just a blessing and i don't deserve her i always said i don't deserve this kid <laughs> i don't deserve this kid thank you jesus she's amazing and i know people say that about their children all the time and i guess it's just a parent thing maybe if, as a mom that's what you do but I watch her and I see she, her do some things that I'm just, I'm, like for example, I'll give an example. I, I always worry that she's not gonna get the nutrition that she needs to get 
because she's not growing up the way I grew up. When I grew up in Jamaica, everything was organic. Everything is organic. So you walk and you pick mangoes off the trees. You walk and pick bananas off the trees. You don't go to the store necessarily to buy those things. You go to the store to buy processed things, which you really don't need, like cheese, um, I don't know, something you see on TV that's from America, you want to buy it. But in the in, in how you live, you don't really have to go to the supermarket to live. Your backyard has everything you need. You go pick your tomatoes, you go pick your, your peppers. We used to have cane. We had um, apple trees. We had, I think, our rose apple. We had star apple. There were so many fruits. They were all fresh. They were all colorful. They were all juicy. They were all, I mean, there was. it's great. And so I grew up with that diet, and I watch what she's eating, and it's like potato chips, and you know just process stuff and i worry like she's she, she gonna be healthy when she grows up and to my just just to my surprise or just as a blessing from god my daughter loves to eat vegetables you do not have to force this child to eat vegetables she will eat carrots celery cucumber tomato sweet pep i mean bell peppers you just need to cut vegetables up and put in her plate and she devours it all. She loves to drink tea and she loves to drink tea that's like green tea, like herbal tea, minty. I put some mint in my backyard. I pick the leaf. I put some tea. She drinks. Like those are the things that I get blessed with, which is what I'm talking about. Like I, I don't have to really struggle and feel so guilty that I'm not giving her the good diet that she deserves because she will just naturally gravitate towards them. I would put them in the refrigerator and she goes in there and takes it, just takes a carrot and start eating like a rabbit. <laughs> I am, so that, that to me, those are the things I'm blessed with, right? So, and many others. So, so, you know, I couldn't, I'm just glad that God gave me a child like that because maybe I wouldn't be a good mom if I didn't have, maybe if I had to struggle to feed them, then I don't know what would happen, but thank God, this is not my problem. So anyway, I'm going to get back to the story, I promise. <laughs> so anyway, I am at this point just ready to get a job. Um, enough of me being home. The whole story of how I got divorced is another thing. Very dramatic, very dramatic. But I will tell you guys about that another time. So I apply for jobs. And at this point, I'm a little bit nervous because I have never actually had a job in the U.S. All of my job has been in Jamaica as a business analyst. And then I took a two, you know, two years to go do my master's degree. And so there's a two year gap, although they could see that I was doing my master's at the time. So it's not like I wasn't doing anything, but working experiences, you know, in terms of working experience, I didn't have two years. The last two years was not working, was studying. So I was nervous about that because if they ask for references, I don't have any because the references I have are in Jamaica. Americans are gonna call Jamaica to, to find out. You know, it's not easy for them to do that. And the those people are scattered all over the place right now. Who knows where they are? So I was like, I'm screwed here. I don't have any work experience in the US. How am I going to convince them to hire me over, you know, a person who's born or lived in America, has experience in America? What am I gonna do? So I go to interviews and some of them, I only did voice call interviews. And there's a whole story about how I actually got to do interviews with the baby because my husband's gone all day. I had the baby uh, doing the interview. He did, at the time it was not cool that like you had a baby crying in the background or whatever, right? Now that we have COVID, everybody's like, okay, with all that kind of stuff. But at the time this was not like, I thought it was unprofessional. So and my mom was here for a while, but she had to go back, right? So I was with the baby most of the time and I was trying to get his mom to help, which she did. I'll tell you about that story too. There's a lot of stories I could tell. But anyway, I eventually got a call. I was applying, 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 applying. Right? I applied to everywhere I could. My resume was all over the place. I even got caught in a scam one time. <laughs> I, got, I mean, this is so much I could tell y'all. I got caught in a scam where I thought it was a job and they were just sucking my information. Who knows what they do with it? But anyway, eventually I got called. There were two prospects that it boiled down to after all of that, that work. It took around six months to really get some kind of traction on the applications that I was doing. So by this time, the baby was close, getting close to nine months. And so I was really feeling comfortable leaving her to go work because you know, she, I've been with her so long. So, and I would have, I planned to have my mom stay with her 
or take her to the daycare like once i started working i would spend my money to make sure my daughter is okay right so anyway and my husband was finding that too um so it boiled onto two jobs they called me and they talked about the job the role i did my best in the call and it led to interviews for both of them so the first one well actually it led to interviews for one of them first the second one didn't come to an interview yet actually yeah so <laughs> you know when you're applying for jobs sometimes you talk to a lot of people and you think that this is the one that's going to work out because you have a good vibe or you know you thought that they were really serious and you like that one more than the other one and it turns out to be the opposite sometimes the one that comes up is not the one that you thought so anyway these people called me and we made an appointment for me to come in for a in-person interview so i get all dressed up you know i'm all fly you know you know your girl get ready got my heels on i got my nice suit on you know i'm ready to go ready to go right um and i get in there and this place is gorgeous y'all this office i was like i could see myself working here i could see myself working here the office was beautiful it had like gold columns in different places that open you could see like a skylight it was just bright and beautiful and it just sparkled it just sparkled it looked beautiful it just was awesome and i was like in awe just coming through the doors i was like wow this place is so amazing i want this job <laughs> i want this job <laughs> so i get in there and I, I you know i talk to the security people or whatever um and they call whoever needs to come to the interview with me and this person comes down the stairs and they come out and it, i felt like they were looking past me and then i was like is that the person i'm going to talk to and i was just standing there and then they made contact with me and then they said "Huh, oh, are you mrs warman and i said yes and the person looked at the resume and said okay now at the time i didn't i didn't pay attention to it but there was like this hesitation like a little bit of a hesitation but i didn't pay attention to it because you know i'm just trying to do my best trying to put on my best face trying to go in there and impress right get the spark because the space is blah so i get in there she said she says you know she shakes my hand and she said okay miss warman we can go into this room and she took me into the room and i could tell that that lady was not impressed with me this is not the face that she expected <laughs> to see okay <laughs> i'm saying that without any you know hard proof but it was just <sighs> so i have a very strong relationship with god and sometimes i understand things that i don't really understand uh, let me explain like sometimes i would feel things before i know why i feel them you know what i'm saying like I've had several experiences in my life that I'm like, oh, that's why I was so mad. That's why I was so anxious. That's like, it happens after. And I'm, I realize, oh, that's what happened. So I have this, I don't know, way of understanding something or feeling something before I know why. And it's weird. I get it. But that's what happened. So when I was there, I got the feeling that she just did, was not going to give you this job. Like, this is not going to be your job. And it, 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 I, I, would, I didn't know what to do with that information at the time when I understood it. So, so I was doing my best in the, in the interview, trying to put on my best face, you know, smiling, all the things I tell you to do in your interviews, I was doing them. And this is not the face you wanted to see. Now that I look back at it, she looked past me because she wasn't expecting to see a black person. And I'm not a person to talk about racism because some of y'all, y'all tripping on racism too much sometimes. Like, I feel like, Black America has gotten completely obsessed with racism and everything is racist. Everything, everything is racist. And that's not true, right? For example, I went to the mechanic the other day, he's a black mechanic, and I was the only person there. And, you know, he's a great mechanic, but he came. I was there to, at the store before he came. He came, he opened the, 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 the garage. Then he went on his, com you know, his computer, he was doing some paperwork. Uh, he said, I'm going to deal with you in a minute. And he did some other stuff. Other people came in. I was there for like an hour before he actually looked at my car and I was there for another three hours and I spent like from 10 o'clock I left there at three now if it was a white person you'd say well it's because you're black and he's racist but that's not the case some people just things just happen <laughs> and some people are terrible and some people are great and some people are just bad 
and they're not good. So not everything is racism. But this case, with this woman, yeah, that one was racism. I'm telling you, the lady did not expect, my name is Carolise Warman. Warman is actually a German name because my husband's family has history with Germany and World War II and all that stuff. So that's where the name comes from. So when I married him, I took his name. And so Carolise is not really a black name either. So they didn't know what to look for. Um, and I, maybe she didn't read my resume and see that, you know, I had college. Well, maybe because all of my education also was not in countries that were black. I don't know if she just didn't notice that I was a black person. But anyway, she did not expect to see me. And so she took me to the interview. And this is why I know it was racism. She took me to the interview and she sat down across from me. And she started asking me a bunch of questions that had nothing to do with the job at all. The question she was asking me was never on the job description. The things that she was saying is like she's expecting me to fail. For example, she said, um, you know, one of our offices is in Brazil and we're going to need the business analyst to be able to um, elicit requirements in Portuguese. Do you speak Portuguese? Really? Really, bitch, really? <laughs> That's what I was going in my head. I was like, really? Really? <laughs> like, don't you think that if I had seen must speak Portuguese on the job description that I would have applied for this job, I would have known that that's something I cannot wing. I can't wing being able to speak Portuguese. So why would you come into the job interview and start throwing all these random things that was never a part of the job description into the interview? You're just trying to have a reason to say that I don't qualify. That's what you're doing. And so I could have put her in her place at the time, but I'm a very reserved person. You really have to get me really riled up for me to really, you know, like just point it out to you. So I just told her, no, I don't speak Portuguese. Now I could have said that I speak Spanish and I speak Mandarin and all that stuff because I do, but I already knew that was not going to be my job. Like the spirit already told me that. So I was like, let me just finish this sham interview and just get out of here because <laughs> right? I already know what's, what time it is. Okay. So I said, no, ma'am, I don't speak Portuguese. Thank you very much. And so she kept asking me a bunch of other questions and I gave her the answers that she wanted. And she said, okay, Miss Warman, thank you so much. We'll, get, we'll be in touch. And I said, thank you very much. Mm, 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 mm. Took my bag and I went on that beautiful place. And I, it hurt me though. It kind of hurt me because I thought to myself, wow, like in my country, I don't, I don't have to struggle like this, you know. I am, I am, you know. People like me are hard to get anyway, and so I. It's easier for me to get a job, and I'm like, here I am in this country, left everything that I know. I'm in this country. I'm trying to get a job. I have to deal with all kinds of things, and I was a little defeated. I'm gonna tell you the truth. I was a little defeated. I felt a little bad, and so when I went home. I think my mom was still there and I, she asked me how the interview went and I told her I'm not getting that job. And she was like, oh, she was really, she felt it too because they both wanted me to start working because I just, I just like being independent and I really want to contribute to my family and I, I just wanted to have something to do that would use my skills. I was thinking to myself, I have this bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, I, have, I know I can speak all these languages and I can get a job? <laughs> really? Did I go to school for so many years and I cannot get a job? Oh my God, I was really, really starting to feel defeated. I was feeling like, this is my life now. I'm just going to be a stay-at-home mom and that's all I can do. At the time, I didn't have my website. I wasn't doing any of this stuff yet. So um, my mom, by the way, is a prayer. I call her a prayer warrior. She's very, very religious, but also very, I always say that God is afraid of my mom because my mom prays with power and authority. She prays as if she demands of God what she wants. And in a way, it's, it's impressive to me, but in a way I was like, <laughs> I'm scared when she starts praying. So sometimes my mom gets these um, thoughts or this feeling that she's like, you know, I, I, just, I felt it. I felt like you wouldn't get that job. I felt it. Like she felt it too. Sometimes she feels things that she doesn't even know why she feels either. So we both have that weird thing. Um, so my mom that night, 
she said she's gonna pray for me and she she doesn't pray for me like with me she goes off into her own space and she prays and she comes out of the prayer and she sees me outside i was like sitting down and uh, watching tv or something silly i was doing and she said i prayed about your job and don't you worry your job is coming i'm done <laughs> that's how she is she makes her these demands of heaven of god and then she doesn't talk about it no more she don't ask about it. she don't want to know about it she's like i've already talked to god about it this is what we're getting and this is it and so she's done that for many things in my life i was like okay then and it comes to fruition i'm like oh, okay god is scared of you god will do whatever you say come pray for me for this <laughs> but obviously you know it doesn't work always um like that but anyway so she prayed about it and i think a couple of days passed and then i got a call I got a call from a company I didn't even remember I applied to. So they called me and said, we saw your application for business analyst, uh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yes, 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 I did. And so what do you think about that? I'm like, I don't know nothing. I don't remember the company. I don't remember the job. I don't know what's on the job description. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. But I'll wing it. You know me, I'm very good at winging it. The words just come out of my mouth, right? I just say things. And so <laughs> whatever I said was good enough. And so they said, okay, we want to set up a in-person interview for you and um fine i said okay no problem and they gave me the address when i get to the interview i am telling you this is the irony of god when i drove to the location it just turned out that the place that i was going for this new interview was right across the street from the place where i'd been to with the lady who was telling me about portuguese right and i'm like what a coincidence like it's right across the, the the road and so it wasn't um it wasn't as beautiful obviously it wasn't like stunning like that you know it was a job and it was paying me the money i wanted to get so i went into the interview and before i went to the interview i was told a bunch of things about america in jamaica we don't have a lot of rules about what you can and cannot talk about when you're in an interview but i went and i wanted to clarify what I should be able to say and not say in an interview because I wanted to make sure I'm not breaking any laws. I didn't know that the laws is mainly for the employers, but they can't ask as opposed to what the, you know, the, the person looking for a job can and cannot say. I didn't really realize that. So I was in there and I was thinking to myself, do I tell them that I have a kid or not? Cause I was told that you don't, you shouldn't expose that you have a child because they're going to think that you're not going to have the pay, the attention to the job because you're going to be busy with your newborn. So, I was like, do I say that? And then I was like, I'm from Jamaica. I don't have an experience in the US. How do I handle saying that I don't work? I've never worked in the US before. And how are they going to relate to my Jamaican experience? And is that going to make a big problem for them? I was like, oh my God, I was, there's so many things right into my mind. I didn't know how to handle it. So I went in there and I said, Lord, just give me the words. Give me the words, dear Jesus, because I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about this. I've never worked in the US before. I don't know what to expect. Just give me the words and help me, Lord, to do the, right, the best I can. If it is your will, let me get this job in Jesus' name. I went into that job. It's hiding the job in the interview sorry i sat in the interview and there was like a panel of people sitting in the interview and they're asking me a bunch of questions asking me a bunch of questions and they came to some situational questions and one of the situational questions was tell me about a time when you disagreed with your manager and how did you handle that and I'll give you a little backstory. On my resume, I only put the jobs where I've worked as a business analyst in Jamaica. I didn't put any of my other jobs, or maybe I did, but I didn't go into detail because there were jobs like a cashier here, you know, um, a store clerk. Like I thought those were like two menial jobs. I didn't want to make big, I didn't want to put too much of those on my resume. I put the jobs that were like when I was IT manager and blah, blah, I put those jobs. But this particular question that they asked me, for some reason, in my spirit, it just said, talk about your job at the car mart, at the, the car dealership. And I didn't want to say it. it. This is a battle I'm having in my head in like seconds because I need to answer this question. In, this, in my head, I don't want to talk about my car sales job because that's not a business analyst job. You, you're trying to answer a question and also prove to them that you are a fit for them as a business analyst. So I'm going to talk about my car sales job. When I was, I worked as a, a rares clerk 
slash cashier at a car dealership back in Jamaica and this was before I went to college it was just like a little menial job I was like why am I gonna talk about that but that was what was on my heart to talk about and I just gave in I just like you know this is happening in milliseconds guys quick my brain is fast you know I I can go like that so I was like oh Jesus why do you make me talk about this now they're gonna think of me as some little country bunkin but anyway <laughs> let me talk about it so I explained to them that I was working one time as a arrears clerk in a car dealership in Jamaica and at the time I was in charge of making sure that the people who were behind on their payments would come in and pay and that we would keep their accounts um, out of arrears so there was this one case where this family came in this is a man he bought the car from us and the car was being financed by us it was a buy here pay here situation but he used the car to run taxi in Jamaica and the car was actually his main source of income so he would rent the car from us or you know buy the car from us on loan and then he would use the car to run taxi and that would be provide the income from to pay for the car so the car was his, his, his job and so he came in with him his girlfriend and their baby and he sat at my desk and he explained to me how we repossessed his car but the car is the only way he can make the money to pay us so he's in a bind because he has his baby his baby is just like three months he has his girlfriend he has to maintain and the baby and their house and the only source of income for this family was the car it's a poor family and he begged me and i said okay let me see what i can do and i looked onto the system and i realized that the system that we were using which was a software that was built in-house we had hired a developer to build it for us and i did the calculations and realized that the system was miscalculating his arrears and it was charging him values that he did not owe and it was charging him on days when he did we didn't charge people like we didn't charge him on sundays because they couldn't come in to pay anyway so we didn't we would waive sundays but the system was charging for every single day of the week and so the money he was said to owe was not the money he really was owing and he actually came with some money to pay and if he had paid that money he would have been able to get his car back but the amount of money that we have on the system was, was telling us that he is not that is not the amount he should pay so I asked him to wait and then I went into the office with my manager and I told my manager hey I saw this this gentleman at my desk this is a situation the system is charging too much blah 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 and my manager looked at me and said did you tell him that and I said no and she said good and I said okay and then, <laughs> and then I left her office she was like and I left the office and the example I was giving to them in the interview was that I thought that was Im um, immoral I thought there was an ethics issue there because she's not interested to solve the problem as long as the client doesn't know that they're being overpaid she's the impression was we need to make profit somehow and if they don't know then it's fine so the question was how, how you know if you disagreed with your manager how did you handle it so in that case i disagreed with her i did not think that was a good thing to do and i, I really wanted to stand by my principles so i went back to my desk i spoke with the man he gave me the money that he had and what I did was I applied it in the way I could so you could apply the money to the amount owing or you could apply the money to the the um, the cost for the repossession fee and so I applied all of the money to the repossession fee so he could get the car back I can't change the system to make the system charge him the right amount but I could allow him to be um, like put a note on the system to not put him into arrears for example like give him like more grace period if that made sense so when you give them more grace period it doesn't um, it doesn't cause them to get into to be kicked automatically into repossession if that makes sense so I did what I could I did what whatever was within my control to help this family and so the guy got his car back he still owed money but at least he wasn't gonna be immediately repossessed and um, I didn't I didn't have to tell him that the system was was charging him wrong so I didn't get directly in conflict with my boss but I tried the best that I could to help this family and so I told him that story and then I saw what did you do eventually I said eventually I left the job <laughs> right I found another job because the morals and ethics that they were exemplifying in that car dealership didn't stand with my values as a person and I could not watch um, people being ripped off 
who are honest, hardworking people, and I couldn't be a part of that system anymore. So when I found that out, I shortly left the job a couple of months afterwards. I found another job and left. And so I told that story, and unbeknownst to me, this company was actually working with car dealerships, and car loans was a part of their main um, offering. I didn't know that. When I got the job later on, I realized that. So that is why God wanted me to talk about the car dealership experience because that would give them the ability to see me in that light and would connect better with what they're trying to do in their, in their company. So had I gone and talked about when I was an IT manager um, with an insurance company, blah, 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 that wouldn't have sunk. It wouldn't have sunk in with them. You know what I mean? It wouldn't have had an impact. So that was one thing that happened in the interview. The other thing was I was hesitant to say that I have a newborn, like I have a new baby or whatever. I didn't want to talk about that because I felt like that was one of their business. And two, I didn't know if that was going to breach any rules. Cause again, I'm new to the country. I know America is very strange with all these rules and laws and stuff. And I don't know all of them. And I didn't want to just like say things I wasn't supposed to say. So, um, when they started asking me about, um, my experience. Now, by this time, I've been in the U.S. maybe like a year and a half. The baby's nine months when I came. She was, she, yeah, almost, yeah, two years. Nine, two nine's eighteen. Yeah, it's been eighteen months. Because when I came, I was like just pregnant, and the baby's nine months, so I haven't been working. So she's like, you know, she didn't understand why I didn't have a job. So later on, when I got into the job, I, um, they explained to me that. They liked everything about my interview, but they couldn't understand if you're such a good business analyst, why don't you have a job, right? That's why they were stuck. But in the interview, I made it come out. I don't know how it came out that I have a baby. You know, I recently got married. I have a baby and I want to spend some time with the baby before I got back into the working world. That came out through answering some other question or whatever. I didn't even consciously, think. the way I was battling about the car dealership, I wasn't battling this one. This one just flew out somehow. And that did it for them. That helped them to see me that, oh, the reason why she doesn't have a job for this last 18 months is because she's had a baby and because she's trying to be a good mom or whatever. So that actually helped me, right? That helped me. So all of these things, the combination of all of these things came together. And when I left that interview, I felt really good. It was a, it was a great difference from how I left the last interview because when I left the last interview, I felt so defeated. So, so oppressed. <laughs> I just felt like there is, there's a ceiling I can't cross. But when I left the other interview, I just felt so good. And to show you how God is good and how I just have to be grateful for all the blessings he's given me is when my mom prayed for me to get the job, she said, you will get this job by the end of the year. We were at November at the time. She said, you're going to get a job and you're going to get the job by the end of the year. And I, mom, you know, this, the year is almost done. Like, what are you doing? Like, we've been waiting for a job the whole year. You're going to get a job just in the last couple weeks of the year. Really? And again, sometimes I have self-defeating thoughts and I say things to myself that are self-defeating, which I, I have stopped to thank God. And I'm becoming more positive. So I left the interview, felt really good, went home, a couple of weeks went, um, passed by, and this time was a very stressful time in my life. There was just immense pressure from different angles, and being alone in America with no family in the state and no friends at the time was just really stressful to me with a new baby, and I was like, oh my God, like, I just... I just was really, really not in a good place. And I really needed the outlet. I needed to be able to go to work and feel valuable. I feel like I had, I had so much knowledge and I couldn't apply any of it. And I just felt useless. Like I felt like outside of taking care of my daughter, there wasn't much I was really, that I felt that was being valued that I did. I mean, taking care of the house and cleaning, I'd do all that all day long. But I felt like, I feel like I wasn't really contributing and I was made to feel that way. I was made to feel that way and thank God that ended. So anyway, a couple of weeks go by and I get a call. This was like the end of November. 
um, or maybe the first week of, of December, I got a call and it's from the company that I did the last interview for and they extended me an offer for the job. Oh my goodness, I was so elated. I was like, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Oh my goodness, I was so happy. And just to prove that God is really real, they gave me the offer in December. Now, what company is gonna let you start working in December? Because everybody's gonna go off on vacation anyway soon, so what's the point? Just start in, in January, you know what I mean? They offered me the job and they told me to start the job in December. Not too far before Christmas. And I was like, well, what's the rush? Like, okay, fine. Like, I didn't say that out loud, but in my head, I was like, what's the rush? I said, we say start in January. But I remembered my mom prayed and said before the end of the year. And I said, okay, now I understand. God is making sure you know that it's him. He's making sure you understand that this is him at work. This is nobody else, right? So the job started in December. And I will tell you, of all the places I've worked in the U.S. so far, that job was just the best. It was just amazing. I had amazing coworkers. We were all great friends. We're friends to this day. We go out together. We chat. We laugh. We have fun. It was amazing. I enjoyed every single day I was going to work. It was awesome. Eventually, we got laid off. I'll tell you about that <laughs> another time. I got so much stories for you. But it was an amazing, amazing job. And I just thank God for the ability to go through that. And it's just all of these small things come together and form the person I've become. And all of these things that I, I go through and I think, oh my God, this is so terrible. I realized they had a purpose, right? They had a purpose. And so I don't feel any kind of, I don't feel like I, can, I can't do anything. I really feel like I have <laughs> my camera fell. Oh my God. The camera fell down. So I don't feel any kind of uh, way in terms of when one door closes, I just know the next door is opening up. The next door is coming for me. And so I constantly think of where I'm going next. What have I done this year? Okay, what I need to do, what next, what I need to do next, what I need to do next. And sometimes it's a struggle. Some some projects I'm working on for a long time and I'm like, can it be over? Like just 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 get it out there. You know, I, I really want to get things done. But I'm also committed to quality. So I've just been very blessed. And I hope this story helps someone. If you are a new immigrant, if you are struggling to find a job, if you know, if you just want to understand how how we got here and your situation is definitely going to be different from mine, but we can all have the same ending, right? You just keep trying. Just keep trying. You never give up. You never let anyone tell you that you can't achieve something. You never let anyone defeat you, okay? When one door closes, go find the next door and go open it, all right? So stop dreaming and start doing. So that's what, that's the story. That's, that's the career story time for today. Another time I'll tell you all about some other interesting things that have happened to me, thanks to God. And um, I will see you guys next time. Hope this was helpful.